Welcome to Facebook Live. My name is Liliana. I am the nutritionist here. Most of you I have seen. So today Molly was going to speak, so she will be speaking next week. And her topic is going to be on detecting body toxins. So my topic is going to be on some of the different diets. But as I thought about it, I thought to myself, you know, there's not any one particular diet that's actually going to cure cancer. It's going to be the diet that you could adhere to because we can do this for the long term. So when patients ask me what is the best diet, I say, well, there's so many out there. It's so confusing whether it's the Gersten diet or the raw foods diet or the alkaline diet or the ketogenic diet. So what we want to do is look at each person as an individual. My mother father both had cancer. They had it at a, a late onset in life. So I know for them it was what we would consider toxin burden overload. Usually when it's in, you're in a younger stage, it, it can be that as well. But there's other things, hormones and things of that nature that can also implicate it as well. But at a late onset date, you know that it's the burden of the body's toxin. And so, of course, it's particularly dear to my heart because my mother survived cancer uh, with traditional and also uh, um, what we would consider alternative treatment, where my father, he could not handle the traditional treatment at all. We had to go 100% alternative for him. But we were very successful because he lived super happy for the time that he had left. And that was all we really cared to do was give him the quality of life and be able to love him and live each moment for what we had uh, before he made his transition. So it was successful outcome. So when we're talking about diets, we really want to be very specific in regards to what is the baseline that we're looking for. And so we can all agree, and even in the statistics of uh, uh, the American Cancer Society and all of the other sources, we'll agree that at least 30 to 40 percent uh, of the outcome for not getting cancer is your lifestyle and your diet. And some sources believe it's up to 70 percent. So that's huge. 70 percent you can actually influence whether you are going to be one of the two people that are getting cancer, two and a half people. So I mean, it really has really gone down to such a small margin and everyone here, if not, has been affected with it. Someone that they love has been affected uh, with this condition. And so I always say that this is, uh, cancer is a systemic disease. It's not that it's located in any one specific organ because you've got circulating tumor cells that are gonna, cells that are gonna go throughout your entire body. So what we always wanna do is deal with the whole person and not just one aspect of the person. Now we know for sure that there's some baselines we don't wanna consider in all the diets, whether it is Chris Beats Cancer or the Gersten, the alkaline diet or the ketogenic diet. There's a basic rule that we all know uh, that we can swim in the same vein that we know that cancer is there's a specificity it loves sugar now of course if you only you know uh, give it uh, carrots it will utilize that as food too right and we know that it likes an acidic medium and we know that it likes a low oxygen level so those are three things that you can influence just by the choices that you make in your life in regards of a day-to-day -day situation so let's kind of talk a little about what we what I would consider the burden overload. And so kind of when I like think of a, a situation that's gone array in the body, whether it's a cancer or immunity issue, is that the circuitry has been blown in your body somewhere and we need to turn the circuitry back on. And how do we do that? So we can all agree that if 40% if of your outcome is based upon the nutrition or your lifestyle, then the first thing we wanna do is get rid of those foods that can potentially cause that burden load. Burden load. And so what all diets will agree that processed food is the number one cause of carcinogens. And so until the manufacturers literally can have a level of compassion and understanding that it's killing us with all of these chemicals, we're not gonna see any change. But we have to take responsibility for ourselves to be able to say, I choose these foods against these foods, even though I grew up with hot dogs or French fries or all these things that are very emotionally enhancing to us, it's going to take you right down the road of inflammation. And inflammation is at the root of cancer. So we'd say, let's get rid of all of the things that are of processed nature, starting with the processed meats. They're going to have the most carcinogens in them. And so again, you know, it's a fast food type of a situation, but at the same time, you're looking at, I can have other things that are fast food that maybe are going to lean towards the vegetarian side so that I don't get 
the process of the animal. And then of course, anything processed, whether it's vegetarian or vegan, is not gonna be in its natural state. So your body's not gonna really accept it as well as it could in a natural state. So the first thing we're gonna do is get rid of all what we would consider cured meat, salted meat, and smoked meats. And that includes salmon as well, uh, which is also going to be considered as part of these uh, processed foods. Now, the worst that you, we always are looking at is, and this is why you see so many diets that says, okay, get rid of meat and get rid of this. And, you know, and what we're looking at is the, what happens when you eat certain foods in terms of the composition of the chemistry of the body. So think of it this way. When I exercise, I create heat and I, and I start to create what we call free radical oxygen species. Now I have my own built-in antioxidants. I have glutathione and I have other uh, antioxidants that my body can use to quench these free radicals that are being developed by the heat that I'm created during exercise. But when we have a piece of meat, for example, and we put it in a pan, it, it's inert. It doesn't have any life force to it. So whatever toxins are created from the heat we are going to ingest them. And this is why a lot of times when you see cancer uh, protocols, they're uh, encouraging you to eat less meat or to eat um, no meat at all. Now, we also, uh, here at the Center for New Medicine, we believe that um, we should create wholeness and not get into deprivation, nor get too far, don't lean too far right and don't lean too far left. We wanna stay somewhere in the middle where we can create uh, the results we're gonna get through our labs, but the safety that we're gonna get for you emotionally and what the things that you can eat so that we can really create a diet for life, okay? So we, uh, when, when, I, when I went to look at all to the diets, uh, as I have researched so many times, the best diet really on a prevention level is the Mediterranean diet. What do they eat? They eat fish, they eat olive oils. They, if they're gonna eat grains, and especially the Europeans, they don't have genetically modified anything, right? So our body accepts these foods so much better than the inflammatory foods that we're getting here that's genetically modified, that has the glyphosates from the Roundup that's being sprayed on them. So again, it, we have to make choice in regards to where's the location that we're at, the viability of the food, and how's it gonna work for us to decrease the inflammatory cascade. So when we're looking at that, we wanted to say that fried foods that are overly cooked are really create a lot of what we call uh, acrylamides, okay? And so again, what do they do? That's gonna create more of a free radical situation that's gonna end up using our precious antioxidants and we want those antioxidants to be able to support the healing process of whatever illness that we're in. Now again, we all know that sugar is cancer's favorite fuel and so we really don't wanna have added sugar in anything we want to have it in its natural source and if we are going to have something that is going to be of a sweet nature then we're always saying in life we don't want to ever want to take something out that we can't replace with something that we can put in so instead of high fructose foods which are going to be in all packaged foods 99 percent of the time you're looking for things that say stevia or that say uh, lakanto or because even things that are say sugar free they're gonna have what we would consider, you know, uh, chemical sugars, aspartame or neotame, any of those ones that really are called excitotoxins that excite our brain cells to death, as well as excite your palate to want more and more of those foods. When you eat foods in their natural state, you act, your body actually gets a level of satiation on an emotional level where you don't feel like you have to have the need of eating so much more to get that satisfaction. And so we really wanna think nothing that has corn syrup in it at all, nothing that has white sugar in it at all, and even our beautiful things like honey and molasses and maple syrup, it's not that they're a bad food, it's just that there's a lot of sugar to a tablespoon of maple syrup or honey, 17 grams of sugar. And most most patients that are on a prevention only have 20 carbohydrates a day, uh, sorry, a meal, and most patients who are in a treatment plan only have 12 carbohydrates per meal. So where does that honey fit in when I'm just using it as an addition to, you know, sweeten my tea or to put that over some fruit? It really doesn't have a place. So again, remember, we always have a swap out. Whatever we take out, we put something in. So I found this product that's called Agave 5. We get it at Sprouts or Whole Foods but it's got erythritol and stevia in it and a little teeny bit of agave. So a teaspoon of that is one carbohydrate compared to a, a 10 to 12 ratio of a regular agave. So remember, there's always something, it's, uh, it's called agave five. And it's actually really good. It's very, very watery kind of a, a, a syrup. So you know, don't, it's not gonna be like a thick honey, but I'll guarantee you, it'll take the place when you want something of that nature. 
So definitely think, you know, packaged foods are out for you because you cannot guarantee that anything, and they're gonna trick you, hydrogelized yeast or flavorings and you're gonna, or natural flavorings and things of that nature. So you think, okay, this is a health food, but in reality, it's gonna be full of a lot of chemicals which you wanna avoid. So there are gonna be times where you're gonna to wanna to have a packaged something, like for example, Lakanto is a name that you want to look for, L-A-N-K-N-T-O, because they, are, they use monk fruit in all of the things that they do, which is an alcohol sugar, and it doesn't cause GI upset, upset like potentially xylitol um, can cause. So again, you know, looking for these products, you're saying, wow, they have a brownie mix, and it's only a net three carbs, and all you do is put coconut oil and one egg and a little bit of water. Isn't this fantastic? Oh, gee, they've got a pancake mix that's with almond flour, and two pancakes is 14 carbs. So again, it's not that we want to take the fun out of food, because you are going to need some emotional satiety, because I tell every patient that your emotions dictate your state of well-being. So if I'm happy, I'm going to heal a whole lot faster, and if I'm eating foods that are tasteless and the same old thing, and I feel like I'm eating grass all the time, then I start to lose my appeal for the things I eat in a ritual sense of pleasure, and we never want to take that away, ever, ever. And so again, let's all think of foods that are going to be processed, that are going to have fructose in it, that are going to have additives in it. All of these emulsifiers are very carcinogen. And so again, if we just say, you know what, packaged food, I'm going to leave out. But if I am going to have something packaged food, let me look at the ingredients. And let me look to see if, you know, what's, what I'm consuming is not going to be offensive to my immune system. So there are some names that I will throw out, and I think Lakanto is a great name for that, all right, as far as little treats that you can have that still maintain you uh, in a good equilibrium. But you can see the food additives are going to be from your toothpaste, even though that's not a food, but ice cream. But this is something that we put in our mouth that's going to directly go uh, straight into the, all of the mucous membranes right into our bloodstream. So we need to start really being conscious of whatever I put on my body is going to go into my bloodstream and being more careful about that. Um, rice products, of course, you guys have all heard because of the fact that there is cadmium and lead and arsenic in the soil that, you know, in some and, and in some areas more than others, then rice is, you know, usually has a lot of arsenic in it. So again, you know, when we start to switch over to a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet, we start doing lots of rice products. I mean, in, 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 in all reality, when I go from, you know, to a vegan diet, oftentimes I'm eating a lot of sugar because I'm eating grains and beans and fruits. And, and so again, it becas, becomes more glucose than maybe I should take in as far as a treatment phase. And again, I like to do a little bit of both. If, it, if I had my brothers, I would say, let's just say four days a week vegetarian, and then the other days a week, I add animal protein to my diet. So I create a balance and I keep the biome of my gut with all of the, back, all of the enzymes that it needs to digest all foods. Because honestly, when we get too clean and we only go to one specificity of food groups, we don't, we don't develop, we, we lose the development of the other enzymes that are necessary. And then when we eat these foods, we go, oh my God, I feel so sick. You see, I shouldn't have eaten that. Well, that's because you don't have the enzyme to, to break it down anymore. So we need all of our enzymes. And so we don't want to get too far right or too far left in anything because then we're going to start having imbalances and then food sensitivity activities start to happen and little eruptions on the skin and so we don't want to have that. So as far as the rice products, I don't try to use, I used to love them, you know, all of the gluten-free, it's got rice in it. So I always say to myself, if I'm going to have any kind of rice, it's going to be possibly in a protein powder, but that's it. I'm not going to use rice flours, I'm going to use things like uh, almond flour and coconut flour because they're not going to be from the grain family, they're going to be from the nut family, so they're not going to create the inflammation that a grain would. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So again, rice products, let's be careful with that, including the flour. And so really kind of an anti-cancer diet is really going to be looking at, we want to decrease our burden load. That means not have processed foods, not have, you know, hormone uh, antibiotics uh, in the meats that we consume. We want pasture raised, pasture finished. Uh, and then of course they're very expensive, but if we're only eating meat several days a week and we're only having a small amount, then again, a little bit can go a really long way. And, it, and, and most of us after the age of, let's just say, you know, 35, 40 years old, it's not like we're growing anymore. So it's not that we need all of this, you know, dense proteins.
order to be able to maintain our muscle mass, but you can get proteins and amino acids in many, many foods, including vegetables. So we wanna cleanse our body on a regular basis. And so when I think of cleanse, I think of seasonal cleanse. Like I just finished a 10 day uh, cleanse where I did five days of fasting and just really worked on my digestive system. Then in the springtime, I will do another 21 day cleanse and I'll do the standard process cleanse so it's all organ. So I do, I do a detox every single season because in reality, if we're looking at prevention, we might as well clean house so that we don't have all of what, we, what I would consider the rust of the body inside uh, to block up uh, the, the, the capacity of the engine to work properly. We wanna keep it all lubricated. We wanna keep things moving. We wanna make sure we're going to the bathroom two times a day. So many times when I talk to patients and I say, how's bowel function? They say, oh, it's, it's, it's good, it's normal. And I said, oh, so you have two bowel movements a day? No, I have one every other day because that's normal for them, all right? And so what happens is that when we have all of this uh, fecal matter or uh, toxins that aren't able to get out, then our skin's gonna try to, to, to take it out, like in pimples and, and you know, different uh, blemish, uh, different conditions on our skin because literally our skin is trying to eliminate it because our bowels aren't doing a good job at it. So again, we always wanna say, I need to cleanse the liver, I need to cleanse my blood, I need to work on keeping the sugars down so that I don't allow candida and all of these opportunistic organisms to thrive off all these sugars. So if I just have that mindset, I live a detox lifestyle, then it makes it a whole lot easier to do these things because you're not gonna have what would I call big detox Herxheimer's effect. When people are really toxic, they feel really sick when they're trying to detox. They get the headaches, they get the really coated tongue, they get the fever and they get the chills because their body's not able to detox as quickly as the toxins are being expelled into the system. So you'll notice that the cleaner you are, the less detox reactions you're gonna have. And so that's good. Then, then you know you're really getting the burden load down further and further. So again, when people get sick and they don't feel good, I say, okay, let's welcome that because your body's doing a really good job. We just haven't done it enough that you're feeling the Herxheimer effect of not being able to get these toxins out quicker than they're coming on, okay? Now, um, so again, we wanna eat healthy, we wanna eat nutrient dense foods. So again, if I'm in a situation where I'm looking at the value of food, I wanna say, okay, we have so many foods that are filler foods that make us happy, but how about nutrient dense foods? Something that's going to help my immune system with anti anti um, um, antioxidants or enzymes or fiber, because our eating most of these diets, oftentimes when we go to, let's just say a ketogenic diet, it's really devoid in a lot of fiber. I mean, the interesting thing about a ketogenic diet is that 99% of that's on the Mediterranean diet is on the ketogenic diet okay so we know that they go hand in hand it's just that on a ketogenic diet when we're being really really low sugar we don't have a whole lot of grains in the diet and so again I'm still you know in the mindset of looking at each food for the property and for the nutrients and you know in, in, in regards of the value and grains do have a value in regards of feeding the friendly bacteria but all of the grains whether they're uh, white rice brown rice red rice quinoa all of these have what we call not only high sugars but they have high lectins which is an inflammatory condition that one gets in the gut because of these proteins create inflammation now they also have phytic acid in them, which is an enzyme that doesn't allow for their full absorption, which means that they won't absorb all the minerals. So I say anything that has three strikes against it, they gotta sit out of the game. That's just all there is to it. So if they're high sugar, they're high lectins, and also they have phytic acid, that's three strikes in my opinion. So instead of having you know grain type things like a bread or something like that, then I have developed all kinds of recipes to have you know a swap out. So if I want a bun, I have it with an almond, flour and, uh, and psyllium husk. And of course that's gonna be super low on the carbohydrate. It'll be fluffy and beautiful. It won't be like your paleo breads that you get you know, at the store. They're like practically a Frisbee. You can throw them, they're so darn hard, right? And so we really wanna just start saying, you don't need to give up any flavor to really go on an anti-cancer diet or to do a prevention or treatment at all. What we just wanna do is to create, have good swap outs that we can change so that you can have this as a longevity diet for the rest of your life. I'm on this diet. Why am I in this diet? Well, because I'm 61 years old and I want to stay looking 51 years old and I don't want to, I want to prevent. Uh, treat, pre prevention is the best medicine in terms of treatment. And so why wouldn't I do it if I'm advocating this for my patients? Um, so let's talk about the foods that are going to be better for you. Now, of course, 
we all know that the green leafy vegetables are the king of the, of the vegetable family. Now just know that everything from the plant kingdom turns into sugar. If it's a vegetable, a fruit, a bean, or a grain, it breaks down to glucose. How do we know the difference between a low sugar and a high sugar food? Very simply, if I put these greens in my mouth and I asked you to tell me what taste do you experience, you'd say bitter. Okay, so we know number one, things that are low sugar are going to be bitter. So they're going to be the opposite of sweet. Things that are going to also be high nutrition, low sugar are going to have a lot of fiber in them. So they will keep us fuller for a longer period of time. And also these foods, we can eat them raw in a beautiful salad where we can have, you know, cabbage and cruciferous vegetables to help us, you know, as um, uh, detoxification elements. And we can have a lot of these cruciferous vegetables in there that offer us a lot of detoxification properties. So we always say there must be greens on your plate, whether you're taking a handful to throw in your shake, whether you're putting it on a, a beautiful salad, or whether you know, you're just adding it just you know, to eat it raw. We've gotta have those greens for the enzymes, for the, the aspect of the fiber, and the filling nature of these foods is really important. Now other vegetables, of course, again, you can see here that some of these are sweet vegetables. So we don't necessarily want to throw the baby out with the water like carrots and beets are sweet, yams are sweet, butternut squash is sweet, uh, spaghetti squash is not really sweet, but again, uh, it's going to be more of a starchier vegetable. So those we say, let's keep those in the diet because we're going to be letting go of some of those higher sugar foods not because they're bad foods, but because they add up to too much sugar too quickly, too soon for us to be full. Now, again, like for example, when we look at this here, onions, uh, great because they act as an antibacterial and they're super great in the elephant uh, for any kind of common colds and mucus. You got the zucchini and asparagus, all of these are going to be very low in sugar. Now these start to get a little higher in sugar, whether they're the peppers and the carrots and the beets. So what you'll notice is like, for example, uh, two cups of zucchini is going to equal a uh, half a cup of peppers because one is sweet and one is going to be bitter. But it's not that we can't have these foods because they have a high level of vitamin C in them. They have a high level of vitamin A in it. They're nutrient dense. So we do want to have them for the antioxidant properties, but we don't want to have two on the same plate. So when I make a salad, I'm not going to throw beets and carrots and bell pepper in the same salad. If I have a juice, I'm not carrots and and apple and beets and and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna load it up with too much because i'm going to be very conscious of how much sugar that these foods turn into and this is why i like doing a lot of what we call green powders because they don't have any carbohydrates to them they might have one or two but i could have like we have a product that has 32 organic vegetables in it and so you can just take a scoop of that and put it in your water and drink it to help alkaline the body and or we have you know other uh, other green powders that are great whether it's wheatgrass or any of those that you know aren't isn't going to have the impact let's just say of a fresh juice would have because juicing is fantastic but we have to look at it it's still a sugar impact because there's no fiber to it and so again i love it as kind of first thing in the morning as a diuretic you know to help the body the lymph system move a little bit better as far as cleansing but we have to take in mind that it is going to be glucose when we ingest these foods so the bitter better drinks are always going to be your safe zone to go into and then again i just don't put a whole lot of kale and Swiss chard in there. I just put spinach and celery and cucumber and um, whatever broccoli stems I have left over. So I kind of save little things that I can just juice at the same time and parsley and ginger, uh, lime. And then I just put a drop or two of stevia to give it that little sweet that maybe a apple or carrots might have done. Now carrots are great for their beta carotene. So I always encourage uh, everyone to have some in, you know, into their salad raw or into a stir fry. That's fantastic. We, we just think about, I mean, like the Gershon diet, has 13 uh, juices a day and so they have a specific reason for that they're trying to they're trying to really alkaline the body and give all of this uh, super high antioxidants but for some patients that might not work because they might already have really good antioxidants really good glutathione and so again not every diet is specific for every patient so we really kind of want to say where's your chemistry what fits you best for a lifetime we can always do a little bit more aggressive in the beginning whether it's fasting or whether it's cleansing because you have the energy to do it but when we start to get a little bit more depleted and weaker ah oh, it takes so much juice out of us we want to rebuild the body at that point and so again you know we want to rebuild it with the protein back into it so we can create uh, hold on to the lean muscle mass 
because whenever your body's in stress, I don't care if it's emotional stress or physical stress, you go into more of a catabolic state. You go into a cortisol state and cortisol makes you break down lean muscle tissue. And so again, you know, we're working, looking at the whole person. So again, berries are awesome. So if I'm looking at the fruit department, remember that berries are gonna be sweeter than broccoli, right? So again, they fit in the high sugar category, but again, the eulogenic acid, the anthocyanins in there, all of the wonderful antioxidants are, are, are not outweighing the sugar, but we're very mindful about it. So for example, if I'm gonna eat a fruit, I'm gonna have berries over a banana, where a cup of berries is gonna be, let's just say nine grams of sugar, but a banana is gonna be 27. So I kind of say as much as I love those tropical fruits, they're just awesome. Let's just for now in treatment, put them over to the side. But if we're in what we would consider prevention state, there's no reason to not have these foods, but in smaller amounts, which means I'm just not gonna eat fruit all day long throughout the day because there's nothing to oppose it. But if I wanna add fruit in a shake or I wanna throw some blueberries into a salad, especially if I'm making like a, a vegan salad, a vegetarian salad with hemp seeds and pine nuts and blueberries, then that could be a really s fulfilling meal. It's sweet, it's got a peel to it. But again, I'm not overloading because in that salad, I didn't put carrots or beets in the salad. I used the berries as the sugar that was the high sugar of that food. So I'm very conscious in regards of what turns into what when I'm consuming it. So berries is gonna be your best friend. And then of course you can have cherries as well, things of that nature. But again, dried fruit is not necessarily gonna have a place in an anti-cancer or treatment diet because it turns into a lot of sugar very quickly. I mean, how easy is it for us to take a handful of, of dried apples that could be, you know, 40 grams of sugar because they're all dried and really easy to eat like chips compared to a whole apple that's 18 that takes us a little longer to eat with a whole lot of fiber to it. So you always wanna get things in their natural state with the fiber. So when you think fruit, think once a day fruit as a prevention and or treatment and no more than a half of a piece of fruit if it's an apple, a pear, an orange or something of that nature. But when it comes to berries, think one cup a day would be absolutely perfectly fine, okay? And you know some other uh, you know uh, sources will agree. To, they they disagree. They say you have as much fruit as you want, right? But I think I always tell everybody be your own personal experiment, right? I mean when I have too much fruit, I get gas. So I know that it's feeding the unfriendly bacteria in my gut. So why aren't I going to pay attention to what my body's speaking to me in regards to really what this food is actually turning into when I ingest it and eat it? Um, again, brightly colored vegetables are awesome. So sweet potato falls in that, but sweet potato is a higher sugar food. So for prevention, great, I love to have it. But again, a whole potato is 45 grams of sugar. So if I have, let's just say a couple of slices, I love steaming a potato, cut in slices and just take two rounds, throw it in a salad, just for the texture, the flavor, or put it in a stir fry, it goes a long way. So kind of think, let not, don't let those foods be the main event on your plate. But uh, sweet potato is highly alkaline. It doesn't have any lectins in it, but it does have high sugar. So again, we'd say as a prevention, have it, but no more than half at one time or a small amount in your salad if you do uh, are in treatment phase. As far as um, uh, pumpkin, it's very low sugar to be quite honest with you. I made a uh, keto pumpkin cheesecake that was eight carbohydrates and that was awesome. And it was completely vegan because I, uh, I made it out of almond cream cheese. So remember, there's always an alternative for absolutely everything you would love to want to have, but you're just not having it because you think, oh my God, it's got sugar in it or this is not, you know, it's not on the good list. So we never want to think good or bad. We just want to think, how does my body respond to it and what are my numbers look like as far as I continue to move forward in my treatment plan. So um, I love using uh, spaghetti squash as pasta. It's nice, but again, three quarter cups is nine grams of sugar. So I'm not gonna add that with pureed, you know, carrots in it. I'm gonna add it with mushrooms and things of that nature. And sometimes I like to add miracle noodles because they really extend things and there's a ton of fiber in them. Um, just don't try to eat them by themselves without anything because they're quite disgusting. You have to prepare them just right. And I've got lots of recipes for those because I just love the texture of them. And then so again, what we're looking at continued on fresh herbs. And again, you can add so much flavor just by adding mint to your salad or, you know, throwing uh, some uh, parsley or cilantro in a salad dressing. It's so easy to do these things. And they have such incredible antibacterial, antiviral properties. And also uh, they are excellent in the chlorophyll aspect as well. So the turmeric, everybody knows the, the active ingredient as curcumin, which is very anti-inflammatory. So a lot of times I just buy the turmeric uh, tubers 
right? Just like I would ginger. And I use that in everything, whether it's I'm making a cauliflower, you know, turmeric rice or in a stir fry, but it gives it such a beautiful color and it's nice. And then of course you've got all the popular drinks, the golden milk and things of that nature. So again, it can be very healing. I take a drink called, um, go, um, it's called Orga Organifi and it's called Gold, but it's a turmeric and horsetail and black pepper drink and it's, it's wonderful. So again, it's very low on the carbohydrate, but I can have it nice and warm. If I wanna put a tablespoon of coconut oil in there, just to give it a little bit more metabolically active, it works out really nice. So turmeric is going to be on the top. Of course, anything that's gonna help as antibacterial like garlic and ginger is awesome. Cayenne pepper, highest level of vitamin C. So again, you know, these are all nice little stimulants for the body, for the blood, especially oregano, basil, and so forth. So again, don't be afraid to add herbs. Like I made a salad the other day and I had, you know, just peppermint leaves I just threw in there. And people were like, wow, this is tasty, this is yummy, right? And, uh, or just chopped up cilantro in there, or parsley. So I always try to see where I can throw it in. Uh, I love making chimichurri sauce because that's like, you know, a ton of parsley garlic you know your olive oil and uh, you know if you saute the um, the garlic and a little bit of butter and olive oil it's delicious and lemon so again that can go over all kinds of different things and so whenever I eat meat I always want to pair it up with a high chlorophyll food so that it kind of helps to support the digestion of that food as well so again, we always want to think of when we're having meat, and we're not opposed to having meat, but again, we don't want the acidity of it. So I tell patients, if you can do meat at the most once a day, but again, pasture raised, pasture finished, and if you can't afford it, then I would rather you be vegetarian and have plant food because you don't want to have the hormones and all of the antibiotics that are in these foods that again, could have been contributing to the overload pr principle as far as, um, of the situation with your immune system. And so of course, unfortunately, what we're dealing with is factory raised meats are re really not consumable. And unfortunately, when it says naturally and vegetarian fed, it could be with gra uh, corn, which is genetically modified. So, I mean, it just, I tell you, sometimes America is just trying to kill us on so many chemical ways. It just it boggles my mind. So again, uh, beef liver, chicken liver are really great, high level of B12 and they're great for iron. So many patients, especially in their treatment phase, they have iron deficiencies. Uh, and so again, they feel really weak and stuff. I mean, not everybody likes liver, but again, you can make it in a variety of ways. Uh, even I'd say sometimes frozen, throw it into a blender with some other vegetables and you can have it a uh, very high level of good iron, okay? Um, as far as fish is concerned, so again, the only meat that I would say no to is going to be pork. We want to minimize our red meats as much as possible because everybody does agree that having too much red meat in the diet can be, can be they don't know for sure, a contributor to colon cancer and other can can breast cancers as well. So we want to just say if we, if we are blood type O, which usually they can handle uh, red meat better than anyone, we say if we have more of the wild, like the bison, the buffalo, the lambs, and things like that, that might be of a better nature, a small amount. And let's just say once a month or every couple of weeks or something like that would be a good idea, but sticking with the other fish, chicken, and turkey, and so forth. Now there's a controversy with eggs as well. If so if you have cancer because of the choline in it and the carnosine. So we always want to just say to ourselves, number one, am I allergic to eggs? Okay, well, I always say you can do the simple test by taking eggs out of your diet for 10 days and then having an egg and seeing how your body responds. Okay, if your pulse rate goes up by 10 beats more or you get a little blow to your gas, then your body's going, well, you know what, I don't really think I like eggs, so please don't have them. But mostly when I use eggs, I use them mostly 99% of the time strictly for baking. When I'm making my keto breads or my biscuits or things of that nature. So again, if we are gonna do eggs, it has to be they're pasture raised, poaching, soft boiling, or hard boiling are going to be better, but don't do them too many days in a row, maybe twice a week at the most, okay? Um, a wild fish, again, we do not want factory raised fish at all. And again, you want the smallest fish possible because of the mercury overload. And then unfortunately, we've got radiation, Fukushima. So the bottom line is, it's like, ah, oh, how do I choose? So intuitively choose what works best for you in regards of how you feel bloaty, gas, heartburn, mucus, these are all signs of a body trying to communicate with you and telling you, you know what, I don't know, really know if this works. So again, stick with the smaller fishes are going to be better. And I love using sardines and salad dressings. I make like a Caesar salad dressing all the time and throw a whole little can of sardines, I mean, uh, uh, not sardines, um, the, uh, the anchovies in there. So anchovies are just as good as the sardines, okay? So I would say they're on the same trail. So then again, cultured dairy. 
So this is kind of iffy when you have cancer because of the insulin growth factor into it. Dr. Axe, Dr. Keneally is on the advisory board of Dr. Axe and he agrees and, and I do agree as well as a prevention that cultured uh, dairy would be fine like kefir and um, I, lo I love doing the fermented things like the cocoa yo which is a coconut yogurt but it's not like your typical coconut yogurt where it's almost equal sugar, more sugar than it is anything else. This one is a really live probiotic. You can really take a couple tablespoons and if you do too much, you're going to have GI upset because it's so full of live bacteria. So again, culture is going to be the better way. Cottage cheese, like in the Gersten diet, it's all about, you know, uh, emulsifying the oils with it. So to create the interferon for the body. So think if I'm going to do any dairy at all on a prevention, think goat and sheep. But if I do have cancer, I'm thinking of the fact that it has insulin growth factor and I don't indulge in this on a regular basis. Better to stick with like the cultured things like a little bit of kefir, goat kefir, or things of that nature. Okay. Um, when it comes to cultured vegetables, I absolutely love them. And you know, you can get these anywhere now. So again, they're super easy to make as well. I'll do a video on it, on how to, I mean, basically all it is is salted water and then the vegetables, you leave them there for three days. They start to foam up a little bit and put them in the refrigerator. Now you've got a really inexpensive cultured bacteria for to feed the friendly bacteria of your gut. But I like um, farmhouse, you know, it's easy. They have it at Sprouts and they've got their own little refrigerator there and I brought, brought you some, you know, the beets. And again, two tablespoons of beets is only two carbohydrates. So what I've just adopted is having two tablespoons of cultured vegetables every time I eat. And even in the morning when I wake up, I take a shot of a, of a beet juice that is just, you know, kind of the fermentation part of that as well. And I feel really, really good on that. So again, I'm feeding the friendly bacteria to create a bigger army in the gut. So I love that. Now, again, if you have a really uh, a bad case of candida, we probably don't want to start out with fermented vegetables. We want to start killing the back, bad bacteria first and then repopulating the gut, okay? Um, nuts and seeds, again, it's best to soak them. If you can soak them for five hours to eight hours, you release the enzyme inhibitor in them. If you're going to do that, you can reconstitute them in a dehydrator or you can put them, I like to put them on a cookie sheet, just put a little bit of gluten-free tamari and stick them in the oven at about 170, all, you know, if they're seeds all night long. If they're nuts, I do it for like four, maybe three hours at the most, but I can reconstitute them. And uh, at the same time, I would have soaked them releasing the enzyme inhibitor, making them easier for digestion as well. And I like to use those in shakes or in salads and stuff. And when you soak them, they don't get all soggy. They just basically soften up a little bit, but they're still nice and hard. Um, I love hemp seeds as my favorite vegetarian uh, pro protein source because three tablespoons of hemp seeds is 11 grams of protein. So between the hemp seeds and maybe two tablespoons of pine nuts, I've got 17 grams of protein that is adequate for me to maintain my muscle mass. So when I'm doing a vegetarian meal, I love using three tablespoons of hemp seeds, two tablespoons of pine nuts or other nuts, and I've got a sufficient amount of protein with a bunch of nice vegetables and salad, and it works out really, really nice. Um, again, flaxseed is great. If you have uh, breast cancer, we just say don't uh, OD on flaxseed, like don't have flaxseed oils, flaxseed, you know, uh, pills to take because it can be estrogenic in nature, but as a prevention, it's great. We call it part of the parental oils in, re in, in regards of the membrane that's around each, each, each cell structure. So we do like it, but we just, if you have breast cancer, we say we, we kind of really minimalize it just like we would, we don't do any soy at all. Okay. Um, when it comes to other nuts too, again, uh, you know, I love using these as protein uh, as far as, you know, a vegetarian source, okay? So, but again, just remember nuts are equal protein to equal carbs, but they got a ton of fiber in them. So it makes it really low sugar, which is great. Mm. So if we just go here again, we want to not have refined oils because this is the worst carcinogen really that you can have on your body, really uses up your antioxidant because it oxidizes these fats. So again, the corn oil, the canola oil, the safflower oils, we just don't have. The best ones are gonna be the coconut, the olive oil. I like the macadamia nut oil. If I'm gonna have a little bit of flax in my shake, that would be okay. Avocado to cook with. But again, we, we wanna be really protective of these oils and not heat treat them so much. So again, we already talked about no fried food, no over crisping things because the acry uh, acrylamides in them. But here, what we're looking at is that this can become very rancid. So a lot of times when I cook, I'm just cooking with like a, a coconut spray so things won't stick and then I add broth. 
and then that way I'm not using a whole lot of oil. But what I do do is when I take the food off of the cooking element, I will drizzle the oil, whether it's some olive oil or it's a little bit of sesame oil because I'm doing a Thai food or Chinese food. I use the oils more after rather than actually cooking them to a high heat. Um, Mushrooms are always great, and uh, almost all mushroom blends that you're using for treatment will have the reishi, the cordyceps, and the mataki mushrooms. Now, people will say, well, how about regular mushrooms? Well, of course, if you notice when you have buy some button mushrooms, within a day or two, they're slimy, right? So it's like if you're going to get those button mushrooms, I'd say like eat them the very next day that you buy them because of the fungal and mold. And cancer and fungus have a relationship with each other. So I usually like to buy portobello mushrooms, the larger mushrooms. You'll notice that after three or four days, they're still not slimy. So again, if I'm going to use those, I would you know have those for cooking more than I would the other smaller mushrooms. Then, of course, the traditional teas. Now, we all know the ECGs in green tea, which is an in incredible antioxidant. So, again, if you don't have issues with cortisol issues or anxiety issues, I say, you know, some green tea, you know, a couple of cups of green tea would be excellent because it helps genesis, which creates uh, the tumors. They create their little, their little veins of blood supply for nourishment. And so, again, I would say the green tea. I like matcha a lot because it's just a powdered green tea, very high auric level, and it's very easy to have. So I can just take a hot water, a little bit of matcha, you know, uh, powder in there, and I've got a beautiful tea. I love doing it kind of like as my intermittent fasting in the morning. I'll just put the matcha tea. I'll put a tablespoon of coconut oil in there, two tablespoons of coconut cream in there. There's 230 calories. My brain's happy, but I didn't have any carbs and I didn't have any protein. So I'm still basically in a ketosis state. I'm still using fat for fuel. The only time your body is not, in, is not using fat for fuel is that when insulin is in my blood, which is after I eat a meal for about three hours. So just say nine hours of your day, you're not making any ketones. And ketones are a protein that your body makes when you either are deficient in calories and or sugar. It takes fats, sends it to the liver, makes an energy source called a ketone brain and metabolism function beautifully, but cancer cannot ferment it. Although they're saying now that if you only lived on a ketosis diet, the cancer would work really hard and try to break down those amino acids of that. So it's kind of, you know, it, it, it morphs itself to the environment that it, it can live off of. And then of course, the essential, essential oils are awesome. I use essential oils every single day and frankincense is a very kind of cellular grounding. Uh, and so again, I would say, you know, three drops a day in liquid, you know, maybe in six ounces of water, three times a day, I would do three drops and I would put it here in, in this whole area of my neck and thymus area, three times a day would be really awesome. And then it, uh, all these are blood cleaning. Uh, you know, this is also great for fungus and so forth. Uh, supports the heart and the tea tree also on a fungal level. So there's many, many more. We have a, a, a whole uh, Dr. Axe's oils here, and we have some other oils, the doTERRA oils here. So we have pretty much everything that we need, okay? Um, quality water is essential. So please, no top water at all. There's too many uh, you know, contaminants in the water. And so a filtration system is gonna be super important. And then of course, you know, we have, uh, different filtration system, the echo filtration system that we love. And um, it's nice because it has hydrogen water and it has alkaline water in it as well. So it's just not one type of a, a type of a water, which is really terrific. And so uh, I also love using any kind of algaes because they're really, if you look underneath the microscope, microscope, they look like a red blood cell, okay? So again, I love like the blue-green algaes, the spirulina, uh, those are all excellent chelators as far as heavy metals as well. So I like to add those uh, into my diet. And then dulse is kind of like a powder that you can put on your salads and your vegetables, and it will give you incredible uh, iodine that will support your thyroid for functioning. And, and it's a nice little taste to it, okay? So I'm going to just go open it up for a question or two. So does anybody have a question? Okay, go ahead, Karen. 10 minutes left. I have a lot of questions okay. here to go on Karen, go ahead. Yes. Um, what benefit am I getting from the H2 water? Okay, so it's going to have an extra hydrogen molecule on it, so it'll be a wetter water. So when you're eating food or taking vitamins, you want the H2 water. When you're drinking without food, you want the alkaline water. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. You had a question on there? Will almond flour and coconut flour affect both the reaction to nuts? Yes, if you have an, a, a known allergy to nuts, then we won't be able to use those, those flowers. Now again, you know, I always say at any period of time, if you take something out of your diet, you can reintroduce it, let's just say three to four to six months later and see how your body responds. 
when you were talking about no soy, were you meaning no tofu, soy protein, that kind of thing? Um, Yes. So if, if, we, if there's someone who's a vegetarian or vegan and, you know, they're relying on some of these protein sources, then I'd say your best bet is to go fermented and tempeh one of those things or sprouted tofu. I'm not a, I don't like t tofu uh, or soy in and of itself because in reality it was more developed for rotation uh, of the soil and its nitrogen than it was for human consumption. It's extremely hard to digest. It's probably the one bean that is the hardest to digest with the highest amount of what we would consider lectins, which can be very inflammatory to the gut. And it's also an estrogen mimicker. So I would say I'm not a big fan of soy. Okay, so fruit. There's a question in one. Uh, yeah, you mentioned graviola, soursop fruit. Yeah. And so those are, those are all great, but again, just pay attention to how much sugar does it break down to. And so again, you know, it's not that difficult. If it's something that's bitter, bitter, better all the time. Cultured vegetables. Okay, so I love cultured vegetables. I think that if you have two tablespoons with each and every meal, you're gonna start feeding the friendly bacteria in the gut. And so oftentimes we're not having a lot of grains in our diet, so grains have the phytic acid, but also the lectins that doesn't allow for full digestion because they're meant to feed the friendly bacteria in the gut. So when we go on a ketogenic diet or a keto modified diet, or we're taking these grains out because of the cancer aspect, then again, it's very devoid of fiber. And so I always recommend that we add fiber to the regime. Like I love psyllium husk. I love baking with psyllium husk. I love using different types of fibers that we have here at the clinic. And um, as well as, you know, everything that I consume, I want it to be more fiber oriented and not processed at all. So they can't hear me, so if you could okay. repeat. So we talked about soy, just okay. um, you, you answered that. Oh, uh, fermented vegetables, was that the last one? Yeah. Okay, so fermented vegetables are awesome. They feed the friendly bacteria in your gut. But you have to like pickled stuff. Like my husband hates, you know, olives and pickles and 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 um, you know artichoke pickles. But I love it. So just to, you have to be kind of where's your culture from? And so again, they're very kind of more salty. So if you have high blood pressure issues, that might be a problem. If you have a tendency to hold on to water, that might be a little bit of a problem. But usually, when we're on a more very low sugar diet, we're excreting a lot of water. So we need to have a little bit more salt in our diet. So I find that they work really, really great for feeding the friendly bacteria of the gut. So we have, you have to repeat it, some cancer patients that when it's stomach cancer, um, eight sessions of chemo, so to let them know that when it comes to nutrition that they can call and make an appointment with you. Is there any, repeat what I'm telling you. Oh, okay, so there was a question in regards to a patient that has stomach uh, cancer dealing with the stomach. We can get a lot of PTS issues because we eat and it hurts and we have reactions. So it's really important for us to do two things. One, what foods are you sensitive to so that we can bypass your digestive system having to work a whole lot harder. Take out those foods that we know that are offensive to your particular blood type because every blood type has a specificity of what foods they do better with than others. So we would really look at you for what your capacity is as far as digestion, your appetite, and also, you know, do you have an irritable bowel situation because you have a, a, a compromised gut? So we really kind of want to look at you as an individual. So that's what I do is I work with your, your lab results, the doctor, and we, we find a good plan that suits you. So talk, uh, we have one that's asking about the pickles and the all, are pickles and olives okay? Uh, so the question was, are pickles and olives okay? Well, again, we don't. We want to think of organic always because of the fact that you know you're going to have uh, things that are going to be of unorganic nature. Just like if I have a juice that's not organic, I'm just having pesticides and things. So I, I prefer honestly uh, the 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 fermented like kimchi or sauerkraut or beets over let's just say pickles. But again, I like making my own, where I'll just shred a bunch of pickles and, and, and do my own fermentation, which would be perfectly fine. They're just a little colder on an Ayurvedic level. Okay, don't green algae products cause reactions to the one that has fungal issues in their gut? Um, uh, uh, the question was, do uh, green algae products uh, cause more yeah. fungal reactions in the gut? So no, it should not. 
Um, when you're thinking things with candida, we're thinking of moldy things or vinegar things or fermented things. You know, cheeses are really bad for candida issues. Sugar is the number one bad thing for candida. Consumes. So I would say that the um, all of the uh, super blue green algaes should not have a problem at all. What does diarrhea mean, diarrhea mean about the body? So you usually think about this, if the body's trying to, okay, so the question was, what does uh, the symptom of diarrhea tell a patient that's experiencing it? Well, it's saying urgency, let's move whatever you just had in out, all right? And so a lot of times people will eat and they'll have, you know, explosive diarrheas or they'll have to go very quickly uh, and to empty out their bowel. So which means that one, they don't have enough enzymes for that food, they have a food sensitivity to that food, or they've got a leaky gut situation. So again, we really have to identify the person on an individual level with their labs. What to eat to get rid of worms and parasites? Oh, that's a really good question. And so I would say they hate pumpkin seeds, so, and garlic they hate, and I would do garlic enemas as well. And, um, you know, of course we're looking at herbs like um, clove and powder arco and black walnut. So usually, you know, they usually come in a nice combination. And the thing about parasites, you can't take one bottle of something and get rid of them. You're looking at three to six months of really getting rid of these little, you know, intelligent little creatures. They don't have intelligence like us, but they know when they're getting annihilated and they'll just burrow deeper into the intestinal tract or wherever. Now remember, they're not just in the intestinal tract, they can go all over your body. And so in reality, every human being out there has parasites. I don't care who you are. In fact, the six month checkup was established so that your doctor could actually oversee a parasite cleanse for you. That's how important it was. But of course, you know, when the United States, what have you, it's so hygienic, we don't have parasites. Well, guess what? Parasites know no borders, okay? We all got them. So for example, I do a parasite cleanse at least twice a year. So again, just think about it. You parasite your dog and your cat, why not us, right? So we have five more minutes, everybody. Karen, you had a question? And, and what has, how do you do garlic enema? Okay, so you can go online to actually look on how to do that, but basically you're just going to use some filtered water. You're gonna put like five garlic cloves in there and in a 32 ounce jar, and just let it sit on your counter all night. And the next morning, you know, strain the water so it's just the garlic water, not the garlic cloves themselves. And then you would do a retention enema, and just like how we would do a coffee enema. So uh, you would just uh, hold it for a period of time, usually we like say 15 to 20 minutes, and then you expel it. Now, I love doing these, especially if you're on a parasite cleanse, because you will get those little boogers out. You had mentioned certain mushrooms mm -hmm. for um, being really anti-cancer, mm -hmm. and I know that's one of the primary Japanese treatments. Yes. Yes. Um, you mentioned reishi. Mm -hmm. What were the other two? Uh, so you've got reishi, mataki, and then we had the reishi, mataki, and the cordyceps. Cordyceps. Yeah. Thank you. And the cordyceps are great for your adrenal glands as well. Ah, mushrooms. Mushrooms, yes. Any other questions that you guys have? You guys have been an awesome audience. Now, I did do a handout. So for those of you who weren't here and that you are on Facebook Live, we will, ha we will post it. That. Uh, so you, we, you can go to info at cfnmedicine.com and you can download uh, the information uh, that we have provided for everyone that's here. And just share this with your friends because we really want to build this healing community and the only way we're going to get it is through you. And thank you for spending this time with me this evening, okay? Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Yeah.